see what this looks like. So, uh, guys, we're running late today because we were trying to get these these really nice um, microphones that we use for the. Sound weird. We got a little echo. We do. Why do we have an echo? I don't know. But we were using these uh, microphones that we got set up here. That obviously, if you listen to the podcast uh, through iTunes or whatever, you'll hear that one. But for today. Uh, we were going to set it up, and we looked up a way to do it, and it didn't work, so we're going to have to work out the kinks on that. Um, but we'll get it worked out later on, and we'll just kind of run from there. And then I think... Sounds fine. Right. And um, so I figured we'd get started off today, guys, as we're kind of waiting for everybody to get in. This is going to turn into a live uh, Q&A here in a second, so I figured what would be kind of fun is just to uh, let you guys ask questions, and you can just kind of run with it. Again, the audio quality might be a little funky today, uh, our bads, but again, um, we'll, uh, we'll get that sorted out. So the one that I wanted to start with today as far as like a little bit of a, a, a chewy ramble, um, if you guys read the email this morning that I sent out, if you're on the email list, then... Uh, you got that, but basically it came uh, the other day. I was I was on you know during Sundays. I usually basically just read and just hang out all day. I didn't I didn't really do much, and um, I got into you know I was reading one of my history books that I had, and um, I figured I would share it because you know most people aren't history geeks, right? Most people don't get that deep into it, but everybody kind of knows that if you know especially in the West, the Romans, right? They're kind of the badasses of the ancient West. And uh, one of the things that they did really well is sort of an, uh, an overlooked weapon. Like a lot of times people focus, like when they look at, you know, these, uh, especially even his, history geeks like me, like military history geeks, we look at the, the weapons used, we look at the, the way that they fought the battles, we look at the strategy that was used. But a lot of times we don't always check out some of the things that are a little bit more simple, which is, or not simple, but some of the things that are often overlooked are the logistical qualities of it, right? So one of the things that you know I was reading about the the Romans that was I thought was really interesting was about ninety percent of their supplies was food or food related items or items that revolved around food, right? And, and I'll get to why that's important in a second for jujitsu because that's where my mind goes. And so basically, one of the reasons, one of the huge contributors to their ability to fight so ferociously at, a, at that time period was the fact that they could consistently and effectively feed their troops. Um, Napoleon even famously declared that an army marches on his stomach, right? So in a time before before gasoline and, and diesel engines that could move things around, everything is man-powered or horse-powered or, you know, it's animal-powered or man-powered. And so you've got to be able to fuel things. And, um, you know, without the proper diet, without the, the sort of the, the food coming in, the, the capability of the army would just plummet, right? And this is, a lot of times I talk about this, I've talked about this in several videos before when people talk about cutting weight a lot of times before competitions. One of the sort of the, the, the tricks that like old armies back then would use is they would try to get into battle formation to basically open up, the, basically when you would get into battle you would basically then say, hey, we're ready to go. And then the other person has to then like get their people in formation. It took hours to do, right? So what would happen is sometimes is the army would eat breakfast very early and then rush out to the battlefield and get lined up. So then the other group, they may have gotten up early before then, they're like, oh shit, we don't have time for breakfast, we need to get out on the field. So then you have an army that they're getting ready to fight with no breakfast, no food, no nourishment, and then you've got to fight them. You can see how they would be a lot weaker. Just thinking about going to a guy who's starving mm -hmm. and you, you're getting ready to roll with him. It's not going to do too well. Imagine if you miss a meal and you're getting ready to go train, right? Like you're probably not going to perform that well. And when you've got to literally take a weapon and plunge it into another human being, like you can see, well, that's a big deal. And so, you know, simply put, oh, and I thought this was interesting. Like the, during the imperial period, the sort of recommended daily sort of calorie intake was about 3,000 calories for the Roman soldier. Now, obviously, this would drop depending on if they were in situations where they didn't have the food and the supplies weren't net there, but 3,000 calories, right? So simply put, a well-performing army is a well-fed army, right? And so for me, then again, my my mind always draws these parallels to jiu-jitsu. And so you can think about yourself as your own, quote, army, right? Like, you can think about your ability, your energy levels, and your cardiovascular system as, like, the, the manpower that you have to, to, to draw upon, right? Like, your ability to put things out there. Um, you know, in my, in my head, you can think of the uh, the guard passing that you have, you know, as your, as your heavy infantry that is there going to basically put you in dominant position on the field. Put you in do You're going to pass the guard and put yourself in a dominant position when you're rolling. And so when you think about that, you know, when you don't either, when you eat junk food, 
right? And, or if you don't feed yourself enough, your ability to perform well is going to go right down the tubes, right? As simply put, a well performing jiu-jitsu player is going to be a well-fed jiu-jitsu player. And the reason I bring this up is because I get questions about diet all the time. And just recently I, I did a, a sort of, I did a couple of these actually. People would say, hey, Jude, what kind of, you know, tips do you have on diet? Because I posted a video where I was talking about um, adding a lot of salt to my, my diet. I was talking about making sure that you carb up before, before and after <clears throat> workouts. Again, for some of you guys that are low carb, that's fine. <clears throat> that's not my deal. And for me, anytime I go low carb, my, my performance goes down the tubes. Um, and, you know, I was talking about these things and they're like, well, like, can you help me out with my diet? And I was, you know, I was like, hey, listen, show me what you eat in a couple days. And people would bring back the food and like some people are eating like one or two meals, right? Which, I mean, if you're eating one meal a day and you're trying to perform well, I mean, you can kiss that goodbye, you know? And then in some cases, like they're eating like, they're not eating nearly enough protein or they're not eating enough carbohydrates, right? It's like, you know, it, these things are super important. And so one of the things I, was, I wanted to get in this little ramble today is probably, I think probably the most two important meals if you're, if you're, if you're talking about pure performance, not anything else. If you're just like, I want to get the most of my workouts, I want to be able to push myself, I want to be able to really get after it, and I want to be able to recover, is a pre and post workout meal, right? Your pre workout meal should be primarily, I mean, again, if you're, if you're like one of those people that's fat adapted and you feel really good on like a low carb diet, that's fine, do your thing. But if you're someone that's like trying to burn up the mats and you're really trying to push it, typically you're going to, you're probably going to be a little bit more based upon like, you know, sugars, right? Glucose mm -hmm. and things like that, just what it is. Um, Pre-workout meal, most times it's going to be a lot of carbs. A lot of carbs, protein, probably lower amounts of fat just because fat can slow down the digestion a bit. Um, and then after the workout, another pretty carb-rich meal. So this way you can recover, right? Like people, they always, you know, protein is pretty common in today's culture. Everybody thinks they need a lot, a lot of protein, which you do. But then you also need carbohydrates to go with that, right? And so the, the, the big thing about this is like think about yourself in that sense, right? Like if you want to perform well, if you want to be able to push it, if you want to be able to, to consistently go about it, think about yourself like, you know, they would with an army, right? Like you got to be able to, you got to feed that damn thing. And it can't be something that, you know, 90% of their supplies went towards feeding the army, right? 90% that's a lot, right? So you got to think about the same thing. Like you should be putting forth a good amount of effort to feed yourself and to make sure that you're getting the right foods. And it shouldn't be something where, you know, and again, I say this, no one's diet is going to start off great. Right? It's going to start off like you're going to have to, just like you do in jiu-jitsu, you look up little techniques and you find new ways to tweak it. You're going to start to tweak your diet out a little bit. It's going to get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. I know my diet's gotten so much better over the years, right? Now we're like, I'm very, very, like, very, very strict about what I eat. You know, back in the day, I thought I was eating healthy. And I look back now, it's like, I was eating garbage, kind of, you know, but I was trying. And it's just like in jiu-jitsu, right? Like, you know, as a, as a blue belt, you think you're doing pretty well. And then you get a black belt, and you're like, man, I sucked. Yeah. Right, it's the same thing. It's like you you have to put forth that effort because again it, they go hand in hand, right? Like if you're not feeding yourself well, your body's going to break down on you, right? You're not going to be able to f feed it the nutrients it needs. You're not going to be able to get the best that you can, both uh, you know when you're training and recovery. You're not going to be able to recover as fast, right? Whereas if you're getting the fuel that you need, the the, the nutrition that you need, you're going to be able to recover faster. You're going to be able to perform better. Um, you're going to feel better. Um, it's just, it's a super important aspect that a lot of times gets overlooked because a lot of people get into jujitsu and they just, they think about the hard training and they don't think about like the actual eating aspect and how important mm -hmm. it is. So that was my little rant, man. Like a well-performing jujitsu player is a well-fed jujitsu player. And so you need to put forth that effort into your diet and your the nutrition that you put into your body to supply yourself as best you can if you want to improve. Yeah. So. That's great. So I've got a few questions for you then All right. based on that <clears throat> little chewy rant. So for me, mm. time, when I eat before and when I eat after is pretty important. More importantly, before, because sometimes if I eat too closely to training, sure. I get a little indigestion. My stomach gets a little bit, I get some heartburn basically. Yeah. So what do you, and I'm sure everybody's different. Yeah. For you, what are you doing as far as how early before training do you eat? Yeah, so and, and that's what, that's another thing. So a lot of people are different. I know some people that cannot eat close to, to, to uh, training. I can. Yeah. I can eat pretty close, depending on what I eat. And this is where you have to be really, you, you have to sort of, just like your, te your techniques, right? You take a technique and you test it out. You got to do the same thing. You got to be able to take your foods that you're eating and see which ones work well for you, which ones don't. Um, for me, like things like white rice, it's, it, it digests so easy. So just plain old white rice, no, no nothing added to it, just white rice with like some chicken. I can eat white rice and chicken, and it's not it, it's not the most like delicious meal that I've ever eaten. 
but with a little bit of seasoning, it's not too bad, and it digests really, really quickly my system. I can eat that an hour before training. I'm ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, another one that a lot of times I might go after is like fruit. I can I feel pretty good. Like I can make like a fruit smoothie, right? Like just I'll put in a blender and <laughs> with a little bit of protein, and then just drink that, and that'll be fine. That usually does me pretty well. I can eat that about an hour, hour and a half. But I would say something around about an hour to maybe two hours before. Mm -hmm. Some people I know like get kind of whew, kind of queasy, and if you get kind of like queasy from the food, eat less food and just see if you can you know ease into it because you know that's like like for instance I know a lot of people don't eat breakfast, and some people don't eat it because they're fasting. Some people don't eat it because they say they feel sick if they eat breakfast. But a lot of times if you ease into it and just start with a little bits, a little bits, a little bits, it, it's you know it's helpful to you. You know, um, like I had one guy at the gym who was coming in to train in the mornings. And he was getting like lightheaded. And I was asking him, like, what, what do you eat? He's like, I don't really eat anything before I train in the morning. I'm like, dude, you got to eat something. You know, and, and again, like, he's like, well, I'm trying to intermittent fasting. I'm like, that's cool, man. I was like, but just see how you feel with this, right? Because I sincerely believe, in, like, like fasting's super cool. Like, I, I, it's got benefits, all that stuff. It's fine. Um, I don't really care for it as much. And, you know, I got him to switch over just by eating a small breakfast, right? Mm -hmm. Just getting a little bit of protein, a little bit of uh, carbohydrates. Yeah. And he felt so much better during his training sessions. He got a lot more out of him. He was yeah. able to really push it harder and really get more out of that training session. Whereas when he was doing the fasting, he was coming in like a zombie. And you know, he's, he's like, "I'm fasting, right?" It's like, "Who gives a shit?" Like you're you're not getting the most you could out of this training session because you're not even here, right? Like, you know, start stop eating later at night. You know what I mean? So most of my most of my carbs, honestly, and this, I say this to people because I know people have like this thing about carbs. Most of my carbs come around my work my workouts. Throughout the day, the rest of the day, I eat pretty low carb. But during my workouts, I fuel them. You know, like basically before and after. You know, um, and I can say that it makes a big difference. I, you know, if I eat my my carbs around my workouts, I don't get too pudgy, right? I don't I don't balloon up, and I have a propensity to do do so because I'm a natural. It's like a fat kid trapped in here, you know. <laughs> so I, my body wants to get bigger. So I don't. I, but I'm so I stay fairly. Um, I don't really try to get super lean or anything like that. It's just it's hard for for the way my body type is. But I can eat well. Supply my body, and at the same time, like you know, not get out of control or something mm -hmm. like that with my weight. So, what about after? Like after how quickly after you train? Because they, they said there's a good window within 45 body, minutes. Yeah, 45 minutes. Within 45 minutes, yeah. And so within 45 minutes, I'll eat a good meal. And again, you you want to sort of, um, you got to plan them around your, uh, not just your workouts, but how hard were your workouts, right? Like, you know, you, you did you earn those carbs? You know, because if it was like maybe it was like a light drilling session, you can eat some carbs before and then afterwards. You may not need to go crazy. You know, whereas like if I get off the mat and I'm like, Bleh. yeah, I'm like exhausted. I'm like, I'm gonna like eat the hell out of some food. You know what I mean? I'm gonna, you know, because like m my carb range afterwards typically can range anywhere from 75 to about 125. Uh, 125 is like a hard workout. That's like one of those those like summer training sessions that are like two hours long. Where afterwards, like I'm just I'm dead. You're sweating yeah. like crazy. And I'll get like hot. A, and I'll get I'll usually make like a, in the summertime I'll make like a big fruit smoothie. And if you've ever seen 125 carbs worth of fruit, it's a lot. Really? Yeah, you know, I mean you can get like bananas and blueberries and everything else in there, make a giant smoothie. Um, but I'll get a huge dump of carbs afterwards and then, you know, I'll feel better. You know, and, and it helps again. That allows me to get resupplied, makes me feel strong, I can go lift weights, I can do all that stuff and I feel good. Opposed to when I like try to low carb and sometimes a lot of times I don't I just don't feel as strong. Even, you know, I noticed this when I was low carbing it because obviously if you're not eating as many carbs, um, you don't hold on to as much water, mm -hmm. right? And so you have to like, you have to salt up, you have to take a lot of electrolytes sometimes in, in, in replacement of that. And I noticed that like my lifting, when I do that, my lifting drops dramatically. Like my, my weight, my weight training, like my weights, you know, they get cut like by a third, you know, sometimes. Whereas I feel like I said, if I put my carbs in there on the workouts, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. You know, again, so on non-workout days, I'll probably eat around 100, maybe 150. That's on the high end on a non-workout day. On a workout day, it could be anywhere from 200, 250 plus. That's the day, not one meal, like the whole day. The day, right? Yeah. The whole day is spread out. You know, so like basically, like so on a normal day, it's not very, it's not very high. 100, 150, it's not much, right? Um, I mean, hell, like you get about like four pieces of bread, and that's like what, 15, 30. It's like 60 carbs right really. there. You know, I, yeah, yeah. I guess it depends on. I'll, I'll eat some of that Ezekiel bread. Yeah, so, it, so that's kind of lower, uh, it, so, lower carbs. Well, it's lower glycemic, right? So yeah, it's low yeah. glycemic index, but it's about 15 carbs per bread, per slice. Is it really? Yeah. So so basically, you think like four pieces of bread. If you eat like two, four pieces of bread, right, with breakfast, that's 60 carbs. You know, so it's like I'm still eating fairly low on the days that I don't work out, but on the days I work out, I bump them up to, mm -hmm. to supply the workout. Yeah. You know what I mean, so what about um, what about 
as far as pre-workout or post-workout stuff? What do you like for that? Like, like, su like supplementation? I don't really, the only thing I'll do, maybe I'll, I'll add some amino acids in there, like uh, BCAs and things like yeah. that. Um, I don't do any like pre-workout stimulant stuff. It, it, you know, uh, caffeine I think has a, if, you know, it's a, first off it's a constrictor, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. dilate the veins, right? Um, so it can raise blood pressure, it can have a negative effect on cardiovascular, right? A little bit can be great for like some concentration and focus, like a little bit. But if you start taking those big dumps of caffeine right before training, like, bro, like, I, I've never seen anything have such a negative effect on someone's like hard training, right? Like where guys will come in and, you know, I had this, I've had this happen several times. I, you know, I, I can't tell you, like, what, we'll have a guy who normally has a hell of a gas tank. He'll come in and he'll just be over there be getting ready to yak, right? And I'll come up to him, talk to him, and I always ask, like, what'd you eat today? And he'll say what he ate and he ate a pretty good diet. I'm like, hey, did you take any supplements today? She, like, I feel like I'm triage, right? It's like I'm going down the list. And he'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, well, I took this one that I got um, from the store. Like, oh, okay. Like, let me see it. And I look on the back, and it's got like 250, you know, milligrams of caffeine in one dose. And he took it right before training. So his his idol, right? Like his, you know, his tachometer is just his engine and his, his body is just, yeah. just revving yeah. constantly. And it doesn't need to be. And you got to think that once you get into the mat, man, you're going to be going. And I mean, jiu-jitsu, dude, like I've, I've had my, my heart rate monitor on. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, when I'm hard rolling, I'm getting close to my max heart rate. I'm getting up there. You know what I mean? So it's like, if you think I'm doing that with very low amounts of like caffeine, like before training, imagine if you're ramping that up with more caffeine, your heart's just gonna be like a hummingbird, yeah. bro. And like, so eventually your body's like, it hits the red line, it's like, I'm done. You, you got nothing left. Almost like you're overheating. Pretty your much. overheating. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you, so I, I typically stay, stay away from pre-workouts, no, but what I will do um, is I'll use a dextrose-based powder if I need it. Um, if I went like maybe if I need some extra carbs or afterwards, I you know I don't use it all the time. But after a real hard training session, the it's a dextrose powder. And again, um, I'll share the the ones I use later on at some point. Um, but the you know basically you can look online just dextrose powder, and they typically have electrolytes put into it, and you can use it after a workout, and it's phenomenal because dextrose gets into your bloodstream so quickly. Right, so if you're like really taxed, you can take 25 to 50 milligrams of that stuff, and boom, like you feel good. You've got electrolytes back into yeah. your system. Um, a lot of times, some of them have protein in there. Give you because like from remember back in the day where they tell you to drink chocolate milk. You yeah, that? yeah. Okay. Well, that was because so, so much sugar and well, stuff. Like that. Well, right, but that's okay. Like right after a workout. Right after. But because what they're what they're saying is that there's a, a a little bit of protein and sugar to go with it, right? And so you it's it's not this chocolate milk that was so important. It was about the ratio. And so there's a lot of times there is a, there's a lot of supplements out there that have a dextrose base, but mm -hmm. they'll have some protein involved in it, and it kind of just gives you the same ratio. Basically, you're getting a bunch of fast acting sugars with some protein, and basically it helps you rapidly recover. Um, so it wasn't the chocolate milk, and sugars are okay. Like, and that's the thing, it's like, you, you don't want to demonize everything because there can be a use for it, Yeah. right? And if you're gonna have like some of that fact, that fast acting sugars, get it right in after your training because it can be beneficial for recovery, you know? I mean, this is old stuff, you know? And it just, it's one of those things where like, for me, like I went, I tried to go in like, because everybody was talking about low carb, how good it is, right? And I did it, like, I, you know, I did it for several weeks, like, especially like going really, really low. And dude, I mean like, I could on the days I didn't work out, I felt phenomenal, right? Mentally, so oh, I feel so good. On the days where I wasn't, where I was working out, I was trying to train like twice a day or something like that, or trying to lift and do jujitsu. I just, yeah, I felt just crappy. And then like I was getting leg cramps, so I had to supplement with like uh, like supplements like for magnesium and potassium and things. Wow. Yeah, because like you basically your body's just hanging on to anything. You know, it doesn't have any, it's not holding the water or anything like that. I just didn't feel good on it. And so, you know, again, take this for what you will. This is my way of going about it. And so I'm just sharing with you guys. I've, I've done it. I didn't like it. So I'm going here. Do you, do you feel like this is kind of like with you losing electrolytes and stuff, do you feel like you sweat a lot more than like the average person? I don't know if there's a way to compare. Do you feel like you sweat a lot though? Like you sweat quickly or? Probably. I mean, with I, exercise? I think so. I mean, I, th I think that I sweat a pretty good amount. One, because I try to push it, you know, but also I just, uh, my body has a lot of water going through it. So it always, it, it can sweat pretty easily. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, flushing a lot of stuff mm -hmm. out. Yeah. yeah um, I've used, and the other thing, let's talk about coffee. So coffee after, I, I've, you know, there's been some podcasts, I think that I got, George Lockhart, who's like a strength conditioning guy. Talk about coffee afterwards. He talks about coffee afterwards. Yeah. I don't exactly remember the, do you remember what the, um, um, I, the process of how it works? I don't, but I know some of the <clears> things <throat> about coffee. So coffee, first off, creates an insulin spike.
right? So if you take, if you drink coffee, it creates an insulin spike. And so insulin, you know, and I'm dumbing this down because I, I know it well enough to like understand it a little bit. But from what I understand, you when you take the coffee in, right? Like when you when you create an insulin spike, your body's then rapidly taking in nutrients, right? So an insulin spike isn't bad as long as you have things to give it, right? Because what happens is, is like, right, like if you have an insulin spike, then it can drop down if it doesn't have any nutrients to, to receive. Right. From what I understand. So when you, you can take, because I actually do this, like I'll take, drink coffee with a meal afterwards because it helps basically take in nutrients more, more, um, more quickly. Yeah. From, from what I understand. Um, you know what I mean? And honestly, it feels better. Like I'll, I'll take it in like afterwards, like and it, you'll feel like almost like a buzz. Like after you get a workout in and then go drink your coffee with your meal or whatever, dude, you'll feel like like it hits you in a different way. Like Jess laughs at me because like I'll go work out in the morning, like and get a hell of a workout in just so I can come back and get my like it like it hits me so much stronger and like it stays with me longer than it does if I just drink it, you know, just you know, at rest. Yeah, and almost like I guess like a highway for all your nutrient stuff. Like mm-hmm. just get it faster, yeah. more that's interesting. More rapidly, right. <clears throat> Which is not the way you know we always think about it. I always have to I always like I'm so tired after work and I'm coming to jiu-jitsu like I gotta have some coffee yeah. but, I, but I don't drink my coffee directly before like mm-hmm. I drink it maybe a couple hours yeah before. like I actually drink it after like lunch yeah so like, I'm di- digesting and I'm like Ugh. so I drink a little coffee and it gives me a little little more energy a little right even, even energy um, well coffee I mean, it's, a, it's a drug right and you don't you, you don't want to get it twisted it's a, it's a drug and it it can have some really negative this is the one thing that I, I think about sometimes people don't like they don't put enough thought into what they eat or consume, right? Like you think about this, most people don't look at coffee and think it's a drug. It's absolutely a fucking drug, right? Like it's a, it it has psychoactive properties. It can cause you to have, if you drink too much of it, it can cause your heart to do all kinds of funky stuff. It can cause your, you can have all kinds of anxiety issues um, if you drink too much, right? So there's a lot of negative effects on caffeine and so you gotta treat with respect, right? And a lot of times people have, they have shit diets, they don't sleep enough, and they're crutched on coffee, and they're just drinking way too much, and it's it's making it worse, right? Coffee can be a beautiful little like little boost, right, yeah, when you sure. need it, but if you're like relying on it just to stay awake, because your diet's out of whack, you're not getting enough sleep. Mm-hmm. You need to put those things into perspective, because man, like you don't want to be run, you don't want to go through like you know 15 years of that, and then get some really nasty disease that comes about because your body's being just run ragged, right? Because right? that that you know chronic stuff like that leads to some disease down the road. So you got to be mindful of it, and just like people's training, they like again, they 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 focus on that all the 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 hard, the yang, right? But not the yin, the 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 things that are on the other side of it, like recovery. Like, hey, what do you? How much are you sleeping? What do you eat? Right? Like, what kind of fats are you ingesting? Are you ingesting like hydrogenated fats? Are you ingesting like like vegetable oils that are like franken fats? When like your cell membranes are literally made of the fats that you know they're you're, so you're basically your body's going through like cell mitosis right it's replacing itself yeah. over set what is it seven years you're a holding person essentially right yeah every all the cells yeah all the cells or something right and then, and then so if your cell's going to make it out of the fats like what kind of fats are you ingesting it's really important right like like you know jess and i will go to like places and i'll start to start to look in the back of the labels and i'll see like canola oils ah fuck this i ain't eating this stuff you know so i'm not eating, i'm not going to take the junk into my body mm-hmm. right and so people don't put much attention to that kind of stuff in there but it's, it's incredibly crucial, not just for your training and performance, but just your long term, like long term longevity and health and everything else. Um, and coffee, like people, they get into it, they drink so much of it. And I'm like, try taking a little bit less sometimes. Like we had one guy that was coming into the gym and he was drinking coffee, he was drinking energy drinks, his military guy. And um, when he did this, I remember like he was coming into the gym and he would, <sighs> he'd be huffing and puffing. I'm like, and I talked to him about his diet and whatever. And I, I just made, we made a couple tweaks on his diet and got rid of a few things. And then I told him, I was like, why don't you try drinking some, um, like get rid of the energy drinks and then spread out two cups of coffee, like one, like a small cup in the morning, like a small cup in the morning, just enough to, mm-hmm. so that you don't like feel funky. And then have like another one, like middle of the day to kind of give you that boost for the rest of the day. Try that out and see how that works. And we're great for him, right? He came to the gym, oh man, I feel so much better. Like I'm, I'm drinking way less caffeine, but I feel better. I'm more alert. I feel good. I'm not crashing, you know? So it's like less was more because again, it's a drug. You know, and again, just like anything else, if you some there's that there's that sweet spot. You take too much, drugs bad. Don't take enough, you don't get the the desired effect. Yeah. So you got to kind of find that range with it. I, I think the the funny thing about caffeine and coffee is like I never used to drink. I used to drink like one cup. I used to, like a like a two thirds a cup or something. Yeah. And then you need a little more, and because your body acclimates, you need a little more, a little mm-hmm. more, and then so that's how it gets out of hand. You're in, you're ended up drinking you know more and more coffee to get that stimulant to get that effect. Yeah get that little boost because your body requires because it's acclimated to it so I, I think sometimes you bring up a great point less is is better 
but you have to kind of gradually work your way down. Yeah. Like you have to gradually like wean yourself off and allow your body to respond to that lower, you know, because it will eventually adapt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, absolutely. And sometimes I'll just, I'll get off of it for like, you know, several weeks. I'll just like, I'm not going to drink it. I'll drink a like, green tea, you know, like uh, to, to, so I don't get headaches or anything like that. And then I'll try to wean off of it and then I'll come back to it. And then it's like, bro, it's like then you're back in the matrix again. As soon as you drink, whoa. Like, you're just like, I mean, it's, it, it's funny because we get so like, you know, just like people get like, you get a person that's, that eats honey buns and like donuts for like every meal of the day with McDonald's, right? They don't understand how miserable they feel. And then all of a sudden they get on a good diet for a couple of weeks and they're like, oh my God, I feel amazing, yeah. right? Like, and it's the same thing. Like if you don't realize the effect that that stuff has on your body, and I'm not demonizing coffee. I love coffee and I'm very, I, I, I love it. Oh, it's delicious. But you just got to treat it with respect, just like anything else. And so, like, when you when you take that stuff in, like, if you get off of it for a while and you come back to it, it's amazing the effect of it. You're like, whoa, I didn't realize it was doing this to me. You know what I mean? And so you just got to be mindful of it, you know? Because otherwise it's just, like, anything else. Like, it's just, like, being, like, mindful of what are the carbohydrates for, right? They're not, you don't need to eat massive amounts of carbohydrates at every meal. But they can be used for workouts, Yeah. right? Um, you know, like what are fats for? You know, like what kind of fat should I be eating? Should be eating those nasty franken fats, right? Like those hydrogenated oils. So what's some good fats that, that you like to use that all, you cook with? Or? All, all olive oil's good. Um, I use a little bit of coconut oil, right? But olive oils, coconut oils, fats from meat, right? Like for instance, if you get grass-fed beef, it has a ton of monounsaturated fats, right? Like you know, just like like you know, it's like people in there's saturated. Some saturated fats are good too, you know. Um, people have to be careful about that too, because again, people have different ways of. Uh, of pulling that stuff into their body, right? Like, so some people, like, they do high saturated fat dyes and their, their blood work looks perfect. Other people yeah. do it and it comes That's out crazy. like, and some people come out and they're freaking, their whole panel's like, whoa, like, you know, you need to ease up. But I mean, things like, I mean, there's lots of good studies on like things like olive oils um, mm-hmm. that are good. Um, you know, some coconut oil, I usually use coconut oil as a cooking oil because um, it does better under higher heat without being unstable, whereas the olive oil doesn't. So typically I won't cook with olive oil. I use it as like sort of like a, you know, additive something for as a dressing or something like that, something cool, um, you know, things like that. And then like I said, uh, mat, uh, the fats from meat yeah. can be helpful. You know, like you get you get you good steak or some grass fed beef and stuff like that. It's got a bunch of good fats in there. Um, if you get some, some, some fatty fish like salmon or something like that, some good fats there, you know, so there's plenty of good fats. You just gotta be careful and see like, like, you know, where it comes from and like things like canola oil and stuff. It just, it, if, when you look it up, how they process, there's nothing natural about it. Yeah. You know, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not so hot for our bodies. Yeah. It's foreign to your, your body's not used to it. It's kind of foreign to it. It's, yeah. And it, it just, it's another one of those oils that's just really high in omega sixes. So the imbalance of omega threes and omega sixes is just yeah. getting further out of whack. Right. So that's interesting. Two, I'll have to talk about like a, maybe a, your diet. Have you ever done like a, like a diet, just break down, like ever written down, or like I don't think so. I don't I think I've, said, I've, maybe that's something we can, you know, we can talk about your diet. I, I, I eat like the same thing, except for the weekends. Like on the weekends, Jess and I, we, we usually do uh, we usually have a dinner on Friday. We usually go get su- sushi. Is almost always where we go. Although yeah. this past weekend we had Ethiopian. Oh, uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, nice. But we, we usually have one. We, we eat dinner once, and then on Saturdays we'll you know sometimes we'll do stuff. But most of my diet from Monday through Friday is like almost. Like clockwork, the same, same stuff. old stuff. Same old stuff. Well, your body's kind of used to you know exactly the quantities, you know uh-huh. exactly how you're gonna feel. The types of food that I, I'm gonna eat, like I know exactly what what I want to eat, and like I mean honestly, it'll, it'll be like the same stuff for for I mean, just months, because it's just like I'm not eating all the time because I'm like oh my god, I got I I have to have this thing taste good. I'm like it tastes fine, but I'm eating for a very particular reason. I'm eating for right. performance. Like I want to feel good throughout the day. I want to have the most energy. So so that I can get my work done, so that I can be energetic for all my students, so I can push myself to lift and, and train hard. I've got to have all this stuff. So I don't care if, if, I, if it doesn't taste as good as it could, if I put a bunch of crap on it, I want it to fuel my day. And I don't want to be, like the worst thing for me is if I go eat and all of a sudden I just sleepy. I'm like, oh, I just want to take a nap. That, that's the worst feeling ever yeah. for me because I'm like, oh man, like I was feeling good and then I ate this damn piece of whatever, this piece of cake or something and now I feel like shit and like I don't want to feel like shit. So like a lot of times the only time I'll eat anything like that is either late at, like, like later on in the day, like at nighttime, like maybe after training we go get dinner at like a place together and I'll eat whatever, mm-hmm. you know, or on like the weekend if I'm not training and you know, maybe we want to go out somewhere, we can do that. But otherwise during the week, no go, you know. Nice. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, you know, I, I had my first foray into cutting weight for a tournament. Mm-hmm. And it was, was your first time cutting weight. That was my first time actually mm-hmm. cutting weight over like, I think it was like a three week span, four week span. Yeah. And um, 
<clears throat> I, I felt great. I, I think the difference was I did it. I didn't crash diet. Right, which is the wrong way to do it. I did it, and I felt good. So like, I think, if, you know, I, I don't know if people would, hearing you talk, think that maybe it's bad to cut weight. Or, you know, I don't think it is. And I think you, well, you don't think it's bad let's, either. Let's, let's sort of, real quick, before we get too deep in this, let's, let's draw a line real quick on what we see, what we mean by cutting weight. Mm. Um, honestly, I think most people would fare better if they lost weight. So when someone says cut weight, I think of watering out. Okay. Right? That's what, like, when you say cutting weight, that means like cut, like water cuts. Like that's what I think of as cutting weight. And then when I think of just like slimming down a little bit, like losing a few pounds over a course of time, that to me just losing weight. And to me, I think most people, right, like would do better by, you know, again, there are, there are times where cutting a few pounds of water is completely permissible, it's okay, right? But I think that for the average jiu-jitsu practitioner, because I mean, that's, that's who's listening to this. I don't think that like a, you know, a, you know, a friggin' like, you know, high level UFC fighter is like going here, I'm gonna listen to jiu-jitsu for his water cut tips, right? Yeah. I think mo most of it's like gonna be jiu-jitsu guys that are just sure. training, having a good time, right? So if we're talking about the average person, most average people have a couple pounds that they could lose, yeah, right? For sure. they're, they're not walking around 10% body fat ripped to the, the gills, you know, like coming out there and flexing on everybody. They could lose a few LBs, right? So clean your damn diet up, lose the weight first, and you'll feel amazing. And you'll yeah. go into the, you'll be able to go into the tournament without having to cut a bunch of weight. You'll just be able to go in there and be like, I'm at my weight that I'm sitting at right now. I've been really clean about it. I feel great, right? And I'm ready to go. Right, I, I was able to wake up and have a little bit of breakfast. I'm not, again, going back to the, what we were talking about earlier, you don't want to go to the tournament, you don't want to come training not being fed, right? It's mm -hmm. the worst feeling ever. You're going in there, you're you're nervous, you're anxious, you're doing all this stuff, and at the same time, you're like, your stomach's going, feed me, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you're just, you've been starving yourself. Whereas if you lose weight over time, I think it's much better. So I just wanted to make that distinction before we say cutting weight versus losing weight. No, that's a great point, yeah. that's a great point. Yeah, I lost weight, I probably lost about, 10 pounds. How long did it take you? Maybe three to four weeks. Okay. I, I basically, well, I was lighter. I, I, I was had already lost, I had already, I was kind of a little under the weather, so I lost a little bit. So I didn't have a ton to lose. I probably lost like seven. Seven over three or four seven, weeks? Seven, yeah. And then basically got That's to the point bad. where I was losing like a half a pound a day. Okay. A half a pound. And then I was That's like, pretty quick. It, well, the thing of it was, was I would, I just restricted my calories, I think. Well, I still I, ate clean. Yeah. And, and you know, because I would go to to practice, mm -hmm. and I would be like, I'd lose like three or four pounds. Well, yeah, it's water. water. And water. then yeah. I would, you know, be careful mm -hmm. on how I ate, because I'd be hungry as shit. Yeah. Uh, so I'd be careful on how I replenished. I wouldn't, you know, so i kind of restrict just a little, and then, and then every time I would, the weight would just keep coming off, I guess my body was just so used to eating a certain way. Yeah. Um, but it was good. I felt good in my tournament, like as far as strength wise and everything, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I don't know. Like I think you gotta do do you think there's um I guess I say what, like a pound a week is good. Pound, to pound to two a week. If a pound like one to two pounds is pretty fair. Yeah. You know, usually if you're losing a pound and a half to two pounds a week you're pretty you're pretty good. Um but uh you know the uh you know like a you know a lot of times when people lose a lot of weight like when they like when people start cleaning up their diet, a lot of times they lose a crap they load of weight right, right out of the gate. Yeah. Now it slows down eventually, but right out of the gate, typically they lose a lot because a lot of times people's diets very just haphazardly put together with no thought. Right. You know what I mean? Like you know, that's another thing you think about. And I, I'm just I don't know why we're still talking about food the whole time, but like you know, at a, at a certain point in our life before industrial farming, right? Food was expensive, right? Like food would would take up a huge portion of your income, yeah. right? If you were an average person. Like at different points of you know of like you know in society it would have been anywhere from like forty to seventy percent of your income on yeah. food. Yeah. Like just just you know supply there like because there wasn't a consumer society right like it wasn't like you just gonna spend all your money on electronics and clothes it was like food right to live so you know you might have like two pairs of clothes <laughs> I mean, this is no joke like when you look, I'm a history geek so that's what the stuff to look at like so you look at people like they would have at some points like in the eighteen hundred you might have like maybe like if you had some money you might have like seven shirts. Yeah. Right. right. And, you're, you need. and you're going to spend most of your money on fucking food to, to, to live. Right. So they were, they, they were probably, they, you know, you think about these times, like they were really like, oh man, food, like, I got to get it. Right. Now food's so cheap. Right. I mean, dude, you can just, pfft, like, people get pissy if they got to buy it, if they have to pay an extra dollar for grass fed beef. Right. Like, it's so cheap. Yeah. You know, because of the way it is. And that's awesome. But at the same time, it's like, it's become just kind of this after the eh, food. It's there. Like, man, you should be very mindful of what you're putting into your body and what you're putting into your kid's yeah. body and everything yeah. else. All right, what? Man, we can talk about yeah. freaking anything for 
a really long time. So, <laughs> all right, let's see some Q and A. Well, Q and A, guys. We'll do it. We said this thing was the thing was going to be a Q and A. Yeah, got we had a ramble and then or a rant and then it started to. I had some good questions. Um, do you consider those good questions? I'm I don't just know. I mean, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I say questions that I was interested <laughs> in. Um, all right, so let's start with this one because What's that? it caught my eye. All right. It's from Nothing Network. Nothing Network, all right. I haven't trained in six months due to injuries, mm. surgery, now running a business. Yeah. How the hell do I get back in there? You just do. I mean, so how do you get back in there? Like, so I don't know what's going through your head. I know that this kind of comes up. This happened to me too, to some degree. Like when you when you take time off, it can the the anxiety around coming back and grow. Because yeah. a lot of times if you train for a while, and I don't know if this is the case, but a lot of times you start to set expectations for yourself of where you were, right? Like, you know, you worked your way up a certain point in the pecking order. You're like, ooh, I was here. I could beat this guy, I lost to this guy, but I was here, right? So then when you come back, there's some anxiety about that. Like, oh man, am I gonna live up to what I used to do? I probably suck now, probably lost everything. You know, all that kind of stuff goes through, through your head. Whatever sort of excuses you got, but the reality is you just start, just go back. Just get back in the gym. The only thing that I would say is make sure that you introduce it back to your system gradually. This is a thing that happens a lot of times. Like, let's say that you have someone that's at a certain skill level, right? Like, here's a great example. We had a guy that trained with us years ago who was a, a really, he was like a studly college wrestler, right? And he hadn't trained for a couple of years. Nothing. Like, not nothing athletic. He just, no, no exercise. He, he starts coming back and he immediately, like, his body is just wired for go. Right, it's wired for a college wrestler's pace, and he freaking he's get hurting himself. And I'm like, you gotta ease up, man. You gotta like slow down a little bit, you know. So when you come back, especially I don't know what kind of injury you had, but if you're coming back with an injury, try slowly easing yourself back into it, and maybe doing like one class, maybe two classes a week. Do that for a month, and if you want to do more than that, it's fine. I'm sure you're running a business that's so not going to be able to, but. The reality is, is you just carve out time. And the thing is, and I can say this as a, as a small business owner, it's so funny because like, I own a small business that it revolves around jiu-jitsu, but it doesn't mean that I just get to train right. whenever I want to. There's sure. a lot of things that have to get done. But the thing is, is you have to say like, look, I am going to like, this is my boundary, right? I'm gonna carve this little time out for myself to train and then I'm gonna make it happen. And you have to fight for it because life will try to push you in other different directions. Some guy's gonna come up to you and say, hey boss, we, you know, I need you to do this thing for me today because I don't know how to do it. You're like, nope, you just figure it out. Like, I, 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 I gotta go train, right? You have to like, you have to fight for that because you know, everything will try to conform you and try to keep you into a certain schedule. And so if you wanna like make jiu-jitsu a part of it again, you're gonna have to fight for it. So um, just get started. Yeah, I, I think the other the other thing is be consistent. You know, just consist like you said, come in one to two days a week for a month. Like be consistent with that schedule and then see how your body adapts and then increase and educate, you know, your training partners, your coach on what's going on and that way you'll feel I think less pressure. Like Yeah. I, I think for me being being a student, you know, being a, a jiu jitsu practitioner with a coach, you know, you're always like you wanna impress your coach, you wanna make sure that you you know, do right by them. You are up to their standards, and sometimes you may not be there yet when you're coming back from a you know from a long layoff. So mm -hmm. just be consistent. That's why I think people always ask, how do you get better at jujitsu? Or it's consistency. It's you just show up. It's persistence and consistency. Yeah. Just just be a stubborn asshole and just show up even when you don't want to. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you just have to, it's. I mean, that's like a on the mat or off the mat like sort of lesson. I mean, like if you're if you run a business, like how do you get started with that? You fucking just do it, right? Yeah. So if you if, if you want to do anything, how do you get started? You just take the first step and just keep stepping one foot at a time, one foot in front of the other. Um, and again, just remember what it was like the first time you got started. You get started just because you wanted to. So just go back to that and be like, I want to do this thing, and I'm just going to go back to doing because I want to do it. Yeah. Easy enough. Let's see here. Here's one. How do you deal with? I, I didn't really look at it, but we're just going to read it from Baidong. It says Chewy. How do you how do you deal when uh, bottom half guard butterfly and your opponent is smashing your knees with a tight uh, hug, gable grip, tripod pass? Um, so it's it's. I'll, I'll have to save this one for a video or something. But basically, you need to smash their head down and then turn towards that side they're passing to. So if you smash their head down to the mat, um, first off, if they're doing a, basically it's a tripod pass. Whenever they're doing that tripod pass. Whenever they go, if you move their head to the other side, they have to go to the other side, right? Because the head's a pivot point. But if you smash them and turn towards that side, it's very hard for them to actually turn to it. Don't push in the shoulders. Move the head around, um, and that'll disrupt that pass. But I'll try to save that for um, 
uh, for another time. Bernie's bootleg. You should enable super chat. I don't know what super chat. I'm not is. sure. We'll have to look into yeah, it. Yeah, you tell me what super chat is because I'm. Yeah. I, I'm just hanging out with you guys chatting. So, um, what about how do you care for your fingers? This is this is something that's kind of interesting because I've had some numerous finger injuries mm -hmm. um, from you know playing you know gi game and the different types of things. What do you do? I stop playing stuff that hurts my fingers. Like for instance, here, here's like one of the things I see. Like you'll see guys that play butterfly or uh, spider guards yes. and stuff, and the, their fingers are always hurt. And then, um, you know, I'm like, well, <clears throat> for me, I remember years ago I was playing spider guard, jacked my fingers up, right? So I stopped playing spider guard for a while, let them heal up. So I started playing like my half guard with underhooks and overhooks, things like that, not too heavy on the grips. I also let go. I let go of grips a lot. Yeah. So, for instance, if if especially during rolling, if it's a tournament, I'll hold a death grip on something. But during rolling, like I'll hold a grip, and if I feel them getting ready to really, you know, you kind of get that, you'll get this intuition where they get ready to like sort of, you know, get that that body sort of coiled up, and they're getting ready to whop, yank that grip out. Right. As soon as I feel that that coiling up, and I feel that kinetic energy sort of building up in their body, I let go. I'm like, is he about to rip my hand off? And you know, I'll just let go. And when they bring their hand back, I'll regrab it again. Yep. So I'll let go a lot, and then um, other than that, sometimes tape. You know, if I, if I need it, I'll add some tape into it. Um, but I think that honestly, those two things, both moving away from the positions that are hurting my fingers all the time, and then being able to say, like, listen, when they get rid of the, the to pull this grip off, I'm just gonna let it go. Mm -hmm. Like, psh, I'm just letting go of this one. Those two have been huge. Yeah. Like, I mean, just the, just letting go of the grip. Believe it or not, that's probably the, been the biggest one because I don't really get my fingers hurt very often. Mm -hmm. If I get my fingers hurt, it's typically because they get smashed under someone. It's not from the gi. It's because like they get hurt from someone like falling on them or something like that, which is far more rare. So I let go of the grips. And then you've had some finger issues. Yeah, I have too. I had a um, one time I, I actually fractured my thumb because I landed. Somebody landed on it. Funny. Mm, yeah, so yeah. that was that was a, an awkward one, but I did have a you know a ligament injury to my finger, and I I will tape that. I don't preemptively tape. Okay. So like I will not tape my fingers if I don't need it. So like some people will just tape their fingers. Um, if I have an injury like my finger, if you can see my middle finger is kind of messed up. So I will I will tape it for stability, mm -hmm. and then I'll buddy tape it mm -hmm. and just give it some support. And I can use it really really well, and it, it prevents it me tweaking it. So. Um, the other things are even like paraffin wax. If you so paraffin wax, like you'll even see it like some of these like nail shops and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just a good way to kind of help with some of the soreness. So it's like a hot wax. You dip your hand in, and uh, you can do that after training if you if you need to. It's something you can get like on Amazon. Like, yeah. They have it there, but it feels good and it helps kind of some of the soreness. Works some of the soreness out if you're stiff. Um, you know, maybe even Epsom salt, dip in your hands some warm Epsom salt. Just take, a, just like, take a hot bath and just right. soak. Just soak your hands, mm -hmm. yeah. That's good. And then I'll even do some, like, uh, some stretches, wrist. Yeah, don't, yeah. don't forget about, like, wrist and forearm yeah. and elbow stuff. That's some People think, huge. oh, just my fingers. Well, your mm -hmm. fingers, the tendons run all the way up and down your arm. So you want to make sure that those joints, yeah. everything up the chain is, is you know, loosened up. Yeah, because, you know, I noticed that, like, I started stretching out my... Uh, like I would, you know, different stretches on yeah. my, my forearm and my hands, and I remember like getting them loose. I was like, oh my god, like like the, like the one where you turn your palm up uh, against the wall, yeah, uh, and then you like turn away from it, like it's like a pack yeah, stretch. You're getting a whole but pack, to, bicep, nerve. But I'll feel like, I feel like the the muscles, they're like just you can just yeah. feel that yes. this this tightness. <clears throat> Holy crap! So so there's two two things I want to add as far as stretching. Be more dynamic, shorter hold times before. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, you can hold longer if you like. But I wouldn't do really, really long holds before you train because that can kind of decrease strength production. Um, so I wouldn't be like stretching for like 60 seconds on, a, on the wall. I would maybe just really brief, kind of like wrist rocking, your hands and stuff. Right. Like five, 10 second holds, brief, brief stuff. But in important to warm up, important to cool down. Again, you know, I prefer heat for the hands, finger, unless I have like a, a, an acute injury, something that just happened, I'll mm -hmm. ice it, but that's probably it. Chu, are you still running kids' classes at all? Um, I don't run them too often. I, I'm involved in them from time to time, but I, I'm not as teaching as much. Is yeah. the, the guy with the blue belt question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm so that, that was a good question. So we got one from, um, It's a, it looks like it's a Chinese name uh, that I'm not gonna be able to pronounce because I don't know how they pronounce their X's. Um, but he says, hello, Chewy. Um, do you think a new promoted blue belt uh, should be eligible to teach kids classes? 
Um, yeah, I think it's fine. I mean, again, you know, it depends on maybe what level they're teaching the kids. But I think that if you say, hey, you got to, obviously, I think the coach should, you know, help them out and help them get used to teaching. But if you've got a blue belt that's enthusiastic to teach and is willing to do it, I think that's really helpful. Because I'll tell you right now, it's really hard to get people to, like, want to teach kids, you know? People don't like to. And it's, and it's honestly, it's typically not because they don't want to teach. It's because they, the, the kids freak them out a little bit. I don't know what that is. Like, adults have no problem teaching adults. But teaching kids, it's like this whole new thing. And it doesn't have to be. You know what I mean? I think, you know, I don't know what it is. It's the strangest thing. Um, but uh, it's hard to get people to teach. So if you've got a blue belt who means they've been trained for a couple years and they can teach some really s just solid fundamentals to the kids with some instruct with some tutelage from their instructor, I think it's perfectly reasonable. You know what I mean? I mean, because you're saying, like, look, these kids are coming in, they don't know anything. Hey, this kid, this guy can teach them the fundamentals and the coach can give them some direction. I think that's more than reasonable for the, the person. Yeah, there was actually another one I was looking at. It was from Thomas, mm. and it's two blue belts from Denmark who are training a kid's team consisting of consisting of three or four kids. Okay. They're having trouble training them. They're wondering if there's a curriculum. Like, do you have a, a curriculum you follow, mm -hmm. you know, for... for so yeah, so we, we tried two things. We tried one because because I you know I work with my coaches to uh, put in the curriculum, right? So we did uh, we did one curriculum where it was a hard curriculum where you got to know this 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 kind of thing, right? We didn't like that. Um, so what we do is we have a curriculum where it has a few things that they specifically need to know, but it's more about hey, what do you do? Like, what do you do when this position happens? Like, what do you do to sweep the person? What do you do, right? Because, again, I think of it as a martial art, and I don't want to restrict the kids to where they get basically put into a little box. There are certain things that I want them to know. You know, like, hey, how do you defend, uh, you know, this particular headlock, right? Or how do you get out of this side control position, right? But other than that, it's like, I mean, I want them to have some, some flexibility so they can show me how they do it. Right? How what works for you? Because you're because you know the, the kid that's like heavier is going to be different than the kid that's lighter, and they're probably not going to favor the same moves, right? And it's like this with the adults. I don't like to be too restrictive of it because one of the beautiful things that I think about our gym is like on the adult level. It's even like this with the kids now. Is you have a room full of people that have been training together for like ten years, and every one of them has a different style, right? And that's a good sign because it means that everybody's allowed to go their own way. Where I've gone to where I've gone to teams and. I rolled with them where they had like a really strict curriculum and it's like rolling robots, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that the curriculum is, is helpful, um, but you, it, it's not going to be the, the biggest thing. I think honestly, probably the biggest thing when you're talking about structure to training is having consistent training that's linked onto it. So what I mean by this is if you're teaching a class, we should have some time to stay on the, that subject matter, right? It shouldn't be like, Hey, Monday through Monday, we're doing half guard Tuesday. We're doing, um, side control, and then Thursday we're doing, you know, back mount. It's like there's no continuity for there, right? You know, you need to stick on those subjects for a week or two. And this allows the, the theme, right, to then go, you know, kind of get really, really drilled into their head. Mm -hmm. And then when you move on to the next subject, draw a connection to it, right? So, okay, we were, like, for instance, we were doing open guard, right, for the last couple weeks with our fundamentals class. We we're doing some of the basic open guard stuff. Well, now we're doing half guard, and we're doing half guard as a sort of okay, guys. If you're trying to pass open guard, and maybe you can't get past it, we can get down into open or half guard, and we can put that pressure and then get rid of that space, right? Just like you know, a boxer might work on the inside, right? Because it's gonna get tight. All right, we're gonna get tight with our passing to get past that guard and draw the connections together. So this way, that the, you know, you're basically putting the dots for them together, and then over the course of you know, any from 14 to 30 weeks, you can give that person a really well-rounded idea of what's going on everywhere. Now, you're not going to be able to cover every single thing, but that's not your job as a coach. Your job as a coach is to give them a good enough foundation where you can continue to show them stuff for years to come. But if they decide that they see something else or they go to a seminar and they see something they like, they can take it into their game more rapidly because you've given them a rock-solid foundation to base their game upon. So this is true with kids. This is true with adults. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Like learning-wise, you have a gradual progression, mm -hmm. you know, because... If, if you like you said close guard if you if you get if you open it up and where do you go from there somebody right. like well okay now I'm out of close guard what do I do right you know so I, I think it just it's just a gradual process because the, the whole point is to progress to a better position each time so mm -hmm. from close guard to half guard or side control to mount you know submission right so if you're going to so you asked the question about curriculum 
curriculums are, are cool, they can be helpful, but focus, I would start, instead of with the curriculum, start with the way that you're gonna structure your training for the, those kids and think about like, okay, what is our, our, what, you know, how many weeks are we gonna spend on this? How many weeks are we spending on this? Or what's the, what is the progression from, from this position to this position then recycle, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, that was, that's a good one. It's a good one, Chewy. Golden Boy says, hey, Chewy, any idea I'm um, sleepy and tired after sleeping eight hours? Um, eight hours, and you're still you're still groggy. Um, well, you know, there could be a lot of things going on. One of the things that might be helpful, uh, Golden Boy, um, is, I, and I try this, first off, uh, I don't drink any caffeine past four o'clock, um, and this is assuming I go to bed at between 10 to like, um, 10 to 11. I typically try to keep my caffeine intake done <clears throat> around like two, 2.30, but sometimes getting closer to four. No caffeine late. Um, I do not look at my phone. I don't. I don't have a TV, so I don't have that. I turn off all the big lights in the house, and we'll go just to our dimmer lamps um, around an hour, two hours before bed. I put my phone down and put it in. Um, I put it in airplane mode. Yeah. So it doesn't ring. Like you're not gonna. If you call me late at night, you're not gonna get a hold of me because um, I don't have it. I don't have it. You know, I'm not gonna look at the internet. I start reading. Um, I might do a little bit of foam rolling because there's been there's been shown benefits to have like doing some some deep stretching or like uh, foam rolling before bed. So I'll foam roll a little bit. Um, basically, the reason being is that when you're getting ready to go to sleep, it's not just the hours that you're in the bed; it's the quality of sleep that you're getting. So if you're sitting there screwing around on your phone, like and you're drinking a bunch of caffeine and you're doing all these different things right before bed, and then you try to go to sleep, you might go to sleep. But the quality might not be very, might be very good, right? Like so, I can sleep like that, and I typically try to get at least seven hours a, a night in. If I have to, I can get by on six just to do things. But I like to get seven to eight. But if I have to, if I got to get up for some reason real early, I can get up at six and I'm fine. Like it's no problem. But I typically try to get seven to eight in. Um, but again, for, for I would try those things, and then also if. You know, maybe you, there's always a possibility you could have something like, I don't know what you look like or how big you are. If you're a bigger guy, you might have problems with sleep apnea. That's That, that seems to be a more of a common thing these days. Yeah, if, if you're heavier. If you're heavier, yeah. If you're a person. Some people even, even have Even it. like a thickness in the neck. Like, you know, like, like guys that lift weights and stuff like that, they tip it, tend to have a, a more of a higher sort of like, from what I've read, like have a higher um, sort of rate of getting it because of their thickness in their neck. Um, so you can yeah. get that look. Some people just have, yeah, just how they sleep. Yeah. You, you don't have to be over, more, more people that are overweight get it, to, right. to have sleep apnea, but yeah. you know, not a. But I would say just, just look at things to try to improve, improve, improve the quality of your sleep. Oh, also like at, at my, uh, where, where I live, we have blackout curtains. So our, our bedroom is dark. Ain't no, ain't, there's no light. Ain't. So use the Kentucky language. Ain't nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Ain't nothing. Nothing's got any light in there, so there's no light coming in from, there's no like like lights on in the house, it's dark, it's pitch black, and that's the way it should be when you're trying to go to sleep. Um, you can put in things like, you know, like things to cover your ears and eyes to try to like cover out as much noise to try to just improve the quality of the sleep as much as possible. Um, so those are a few things that I like to do. All right. Man, this is a very broad question, uh -oh. but I will see okay. if you can... Broad question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's from Alex Stevens. He says, any advice for someone who's just entering the tournament world and trying to develop a guard game? How you decide what set of tools to develop first? So this is something that it's a big one. Well, no, see, so this is coming. This is like a, a reoccurring thing that I get where people are looking for the exact thing. I'm hitting the damn mic, hitting the exact thing that they need. What is the thing that I need? The exact one thing. What is the best thing? I don't know. What's the best thing for you is going to be the, the different for me. So ultimately, you've got to take it upon yourself to figure this out for yourself. I can give you directions on like, hey, maybe look at this. But really what you've got to sit down and do is you've got to expose yourself to as much information as possible and try to use it and then figure out like, well, what's working best for me? When you're talking about going into a competition, if you've like looked at my game plan that I have, uh, that I put up on my website, jujitsu.net, I talk about like, look, you're going to take your best stuff. And your best stuff is essentially is like, if I was gonna roll for it with someone and it was everything was on the line, right? Like whatever it is, whatever is really important to you is on the line and you've got to try to beat them. What are the moves you're gonna use? Those, those that's your game plan right there. Now you can grow that over time, but that's gonna be the, the guts of it. Now, if you haven't been training for very long, then you probably haven't been exposed to enough information to really know that, but just work with what you got. But ultimately you do when you're talking about competitions, 
your goal in the gym when you're getting ready for a competition is to sharp is basically to take a handful of weapons, sharpen them up, get them ready, and then take them into battle, right? right. When you're not getting ready for a competition, your goal is to take in as much new information and try to develop as many new weapons as possible. And then when tournament time rolls around again, you get rid of the extra you don't need, you sharpen up just your best stuff, and then you take it into battle. That's the goal, right? And so that process when you're not getting ready for a competition is the process where you go into research and development and you take it all in, figure out what's going to work best for you. And then once the tournament time is rolling around, once you're you know maybe four to six weeks out, then you say, okay, this is my best stuff. This is what I'm going to focus on. Shh, let's sharpen those weapons up, get them ready, and then we get ready for the competition. But as far as what's going to be best for you, I don't know. That's up to you, and you have to figure that out because you know your experience is going to be different than mine. And they're really the, in jiu-jitsu is beautiful like this. There is no linear path. There's no like, hey, listen, you learn this sweep, and then you go to this one, and then you go to this one, and this is this is the best one right here. It doesn't work that way. Like. Eugene, his best sweeps, his best attacks are different than mine. Like, Eugene can hit, hit loop chokes on all kinds of people. I can't hit a loop choke to save my life. It's just not my move, right? Like, I'm not very good with it. It's not something I've put a lot of time into it, and I have a lot of trouble with it. He's freaking awesome at it, okay? And vice versa with, like, techniques I have. You have to find out what's going to work best for you, and I can't give you the best possible technique for yourself. Um, especially not over like without seeing you roll or anything like yeah. that. So I, I think sometimes it's also what's natural to your, I mean, obviously body, you mm -hmm. know, body type and everything like that, but it's also what natural, like you're talking about the loop choke, the loop choke for some reason, no, I don't think anybody taught me that. Mm -hmm. It just naturally, I started figuring it out. Yeah. It was weird. I just did it and I was like, oh, that I think worked. I figured something out. And then I started researching, oh, it's called the loop choke yeah. and this and that. But, you know, and this was probably something I started, you know, because playing guard or half guard, cross collar grips, you just start playing around with it and you figure stuff out. Yeah. So I, I think it's some of it's what comes natural. And mm -hmm. then you, you hone that, that game in because, you know, you, we've got purple belts or even blue belts that are really good at certain things mm -hmm. and they can put you in that game. And then so it's just, it's just weird. It's weird how certain people can have a high, such a high level game in certain areas, mm -hmm. you know, like guard or whatever. Yeah. It just, but, but overall I'm getting off topic, but overall no, you, that was right. Yeah. It's, it's what, what fits your style, what comes natural too. Cause then you can, is it, if your body's kind of already like kind of wired for a certain movement yeah. and you don't have to really, it's not hard for you to learn. Yeah. Well, it, you know, there's a, there's a really cool book called the sports gene. Um, sports gene. Yeah. Sports okay. gene. And the guy basically goes in the book and he talks about, um, the, the defining factors of players in sports and like for instance I didn't know this like the the big the big defining factor for basketball players a lot of times we think it's just height but it's not um, they said that the, the biggest correlating like sort of factor body wise were arm length in relation to overall body length right so basically okay. so wingspan is what they call it yeah so basically their wingspan had to be a certain ratio to their height I forgot it was like you know certain some you know normal thing right and basically it means that their arms are like three or four inches longer than the average person's at their same height, right? So they said that there were plenty of people that were like real tall, but they had short arms for their height, right? Not, not short arms for period, but short arms for their height. And they don't do well in basketball. Right. So they said it was arm length, and then they said it was vertical jump. So if you've got a good vertical, and if you've got really long arms, you're more likely to make it into the NBA, regardless of height, yeah. right? Um, and so they, because they, they measured all the different, the, the wingspans of all these guys of different varying heights, everything from like Muggsy Bulks, who was like what, five something. Oh, yeah, he was tiny. a little short, but he had freaking like long gorilla arms, right? He really? had really long arms. Yeah, it's cool. And so like, I think a lot of times people come into jujitsu and they naturally favor certain techniques because probably what's going on is their body is designed for that particular move, right? Like for instance, when you see a guy come in with long spindly legs, you look at him, you almost think, uh, he's gonna be good at triangles. You yeah. just, you know, you, you just can't help it. And a lot of times, it's almost dead on, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, for me, like I've got these, my arms are somewhat like stocky and short. I've got I'm really good at kimuras, right? Because I have less room to work with, right? Because you know, long, long, long arm guys try to do kimuras, and they're like, there's all this space. Yeah. Yes. Whereas like the guys that have like short, tight little arms, like you look at like a guy like DJ Jackson, he used to be good at like, bop, like good at kimuras, and you look at him as a tank, right? So obviously, got you got short arm, less arm, less space to work with. So you're gonna favor that move, right? If you've got thinner wrists, right, probably gonna be great with doing like loop chokes and rear naked chokes, things where you can just slide it's up under there, yeah. yeah. Or if you got big old thick forearms, it's probably gonna be hard to do. And so that's one thing to think about that, like you know, as you do stuff, your body's definitely gonna naturally favor certain techniques, and probably this is due because that move is probably wired towards your body type, 
whatever it might be, not even body type, it might be just your physical attributes, right? Like Rich, uh, one of my black belts, he had, uh, Rich, he had a really good triangle. He didn't have the longest legs. His legs were long for his height, but they weren't really that long, right? He was only like 5'10", um, and his legs were decently long. But he had so much dexterity from soccer. Right. So he had this crazy leg de dexterity that he could use, and so that worked into his favor. He had a gnarly, gnarly triangle. He had a nasty triangle. I love it. Very aggressive from it, his back. Very from much so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, there, there, this is this is more of like a. Um, I like this question because I think it's, this one comes up a lot, and a lot of people deal with this. It's from Josh Rufu. Josh Rufu. Okay. Um, so he says, when I'm rolling with equal or higher uh, ranks, I often just end up going into defense mode. How do you get yourself back? How do you get yourself back on track and back on the offensive? Can you repeat the question? So basically, when he's rolling with equal mm -hmm. uh, belt ranks or higher belt ranks, he plays more defensive game. Mm -hmm. He doesn't attack. So he's asking, how do you get yourself back on track and on the offensive? Mm. Mm. It, to me, for you know, uh, I think it's a mental. That's a mental thing. Mm -hmm. You look at the belt, you change your game up based on what their belt is. So possibly, yeah. Th that's what I see. That that's what it is for me, because I think you're you're like I don't want to get caught. So that for me, I'm like if that's a higher belt rank or somebody that's you know, afraid to take your chances. You're gonna be more more conservative. I think. Yeah. So maybe that's what that. Is yeah, about. I think there definitely could be a mental aspect to it where you're afraid to take <laughs> chances and go for it. And if that's the case, then you know you you have to think about the fact that you the only way you can win is if you take a chance and go for it, right? If you choose to play defensive, then basically you're, you know, the person's just gonna, you know, come through and eventually if you're at that same skill level, they're eventually probably gonna break through. So you'd be best to go after them and just see what happens. And if you lose, who gives a shit? Play, press the reset button and play again, right? Um, the other thing is, is that it could be that, you know, with your game, like, I mean, if you're going up against a higher level belt, you're probably gonna be on the defensive. Like, I mean, that's just, that's okay. Right, so you're probably going to be on the defensive because they're going to be better than you, um, and you can work on getting really good control of the person and then working to attack. Um, but you know, the thing I would say is going back to what you're talking about, like a mental thing. If you're going up against someone, and, and this is where you have to be conscious. This is the cool thing about what jiu-jitsu does. I think there are like lessons to be peeled, picked out for our own like just life, right? So if you're getting into a situation where you feel intimidated and it's changing you, like because you're because again, if you see someone with the same level belt or maybe a little bit higher than you, and that that makes you change your game, you're being intimidated. Don't be intimidated, right? Like, again, this is part of the process. Go down guns blazing, going after it, right? The thing is, when you go against them, like, you don't want to change your game up completely. So try to zero in at least an attack or two. And when you roll that person, just like, I'm going to go after this armor, I'm going to go after this thing or whatever it is, and really go after them with that move. And again, if you get, if you get, you know, passed in the process or whatever, then fine, work on your defense. If they if they get ready to catch an armbar, work on your defense, whatever. But at least try to go after something. And it might work if you're getting a little intimidated by narrowing in on just one thing or two things at a time. Um, or like you said, just kind of letting go of the uh, the fear that you have of losing. That's awesome. That's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, you know, open maths is a great, I think, Another way to get better at that, go to open mats, go to different gyms, expose yourself to different people. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll, you'll get a feel for where your game's at and maybe what works. Mm -hmm. hey, real quick, Andy Hines says, you should make a stretching video. Kind of lame, but important. Andy, I made one. <laughs> uh, if you go to my YouTube channel and you ch put in like, just put in Jiu Jitsu stretching. I made a, a list of stretches that I like to use after training. They're really helpful for hips, shoulders, and uh, my, my legs. And so if you want to check that out, go check that out. They're, they're there for free on the Jiu-Jitsu channel. Um, Let's see, here's one. Um, this is from Kyle Hensley. He says, do you agree that the majority of BJJ training time should be spent drilling or positional sparring? If so, any advice on how I can suggest changes to my coach and how classes are run? Um, Kyle, it depends. It depends on what you're focusing on. I think that the bulk of your training will probably it should probably revolve around situational stuff and, and, and drilling, um, you know, because again, like, you know, my idea is that if, if I, for instance, like if I run a class, I, you know, sometimes like we, I try, it'll fluctuate from week to week. Some weeks we'll do a lot more of open rolling. Some weeks we'll do a lot more situational rolling, depending on where we're at. But if we're working on a position, I want to try to get people to actually work in that position. Like, so if we're working on a particular like guard pass or like maybe we're working on open guard sweeps, I don't want someone to start rolling and then not trying at all. So a lot of times we'll do drills like where, um, one that one that I really like is where if, um, let's say if we're working on open guard sweeps, okay? Um, I'll start the people in open guard 
and then I'll tell the top person. The top person cannot pass. They can break grips, they can keep a good base, they can do whatever they can not to get swept, but they will not pass. And the reason we do this is because if the person begins to threaten with the pass, a lot of times that changes the person and makes them revert back to whatever they normally do, right? Because that stress is coming. And so what this allows a person to do is it allows them to play their open guards and tinker around with the position a lot more um, in a somewhat realistic setting with stress involved and then this way we can build them up slowly. And so that's one, one drill that I like doing situational wise. As far as talking to your coach about it, um, you know, I don't know what level you are, or how well you know your coach. You could ask them, say, hey, um, you know, like maybe, th maybe if you guys go through a position that's really like, that you really want to work on, that you may like, man, like, you know, this one would be really good. I would really like to work more on this. Um, maybe ask him, say, hey, coach, is it cool if, like, let's say it's like maybe you're working on half guard. Say, hey, coach, could we do some rounds where I just, we, we stay in half guard and, like, you know, if they pass our half guard or submit us, that we reset, or if I sweep them, that we reset just so I can play more. I really want to work on my half guard, right? And just leave it as a suggestion, right? Because obviously you don't want to come in there and tell your coach what to do and, you know, because they'll probably be, you know, everybody, no one likes to be told what to do, right? So any, anytime you tell someone to do something, they're like, back off, right? But if you came in there and just suggest it and see what they say, they probably would be probably, you know, more than likely, I think, uh, open to the idea. So just come up to it and say, hey, man, like, I would really like to work on this position. Is it possible to spend some more time on this particular position that we're focusing on? And just see what happens. Nice. Got time for like one or two more. Um, Chewy, you, you would have, this is, I think, a fairly easy question. Can someone with crappy eyesight learn BJJ or is it a bit too risky? No. I think it's kind of a, oh my god, dude! We had you know black belt you trained with that was yeah, very it was legally blind, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's legally he could like he like competed like he went to the Kentucky School for the Blind. Yeah, he wrestled blind, right? Like I mean like so in in wrestling when you're blind or like where you're at, like legally blind, you have to maintain contact. Like so right. as soon as you start, you have to be touching the person. And you can't break contact for more than a second. Um, so. I think it's fine. Like, I don't think anybody with a crappy eyesight is going to be, it's, like, the thing is, is everybody's going to, like, this is an interesting thing. When people get into to, uh, BGJ, they instantly start to pinpoint their own insecurities about, or their own, like, deficiencies that they have, right? So a person that's overweight, they go, man, I'm overweight. Do you think jiu-jitsu is good for me? Man, I'm, you know, I'm kind of really thin and I'm skinny. Do you think jiu-jitsu is good for me? Oh man, you know, I was a football player and I'm, I'm really explosive. Do you think that's going to be a bad thing for jujitsu, right? Like people, they'll go through the list and you realize that, and, and the thing is, is I've seen, dude, I've seen, there's guys like, like what, what, what is his name? I can't remember his name. The guy, he, he has literally no arms or legs. Kyle. Ky yeah, Kyle something, right? Um, but, but the guy's missing, he's missing from the, from, he's like what, right at the knee and right at the elbow, he's missing his limbs. So he has no hands. Right. Is it Maynard? Maynard, Kyle Maynard, yeah. Maynard, Kyle. Right. That dude. He's doing it. Fought right? MMA. Too. Fought MMA. Like I mean, granted, you, should, you know that's one of those things. Wow. Weird but dude, that guy's out there doing the damn thing, and he's like missing. He has no feet, no hands, right? And he's doing jujitsu, and he's making it work, and he's pretty good. I was yeah. watching some of his tournament Strong. matches. He's dude, he's good. You know, I remember going to like to tournaments in, in wrestling, and I remember like seeing this one guy years ago. He didn't have any legs, and he was crushing people, right? Like. You know, there's plenty of, I remember seeing this one, uh, this blind girl in wrestling in high school who stuck this, like she's, she, her picture's in like the paper because she's like blind girl, like, you know, spinning this, this guy from a different high school. So regardless of what issues you have and you're worried about, you can make it work for you. You just got to be willing to maybe not have the same path as someone else, right? Because yeah. again, you're not going to have maybe the, the easiest path because of the path because of the, the issues that you have. But it's your own, right? And that's okay. Like again, you don't want the same path as someone else. Let them go their own way. You can have your own. And so I think being a little bit more, um, being you know visually impaired, it's not going to be a problem at all. Like you'll be able to pick it up. And a lot of times with jujitsu, as you get better and better, you really don't rely too much on eyesight. It's more of a feel. You start to get this intuition with your body where you can feel someone move, and you're literally it's like your 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 like your big toe t tells you. Goes up to the brain and says, "Hey, they're doing this thing," and then you get the idea. It's not so much of a look recognition; it's more of a feel recognition. Well, learning, I think, may be a little bit different, you know, because you may have to be placed in certain positions or you know more hands-on yeah. learning, mm -hmm. um, tactile learning. But I, I think uh, when you teach people that don't know jujitsu, you're mm -hmm. usually taking them. When we did our, our coach's class, oh, yeah. you took us and you said, you moved us into the position. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you can verbally, some people do well verbally, mm -hmm. you know, or just auditory, just hearing, yeah. you know, a position. But some people don't know, like, 
what this means to put your arm in a certain position. Yeah. So you have to actually physically put them there. Yeah. And I, I think it's a different learning style or, or, you know, your instructor may have to have a little bit of a, you know, different way of teaching. Sure. But it's very doable. And I think it's one of the one of the things that you can do very, very well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's it's a lot of jujitsu is based on feel. Yeah. Because sometimes, man, when you're getting, somebody's got your back, you can't see where their arms are. Yeah. You're feeling. You're feeling for you're it. You're feeling right? where the legs are. You're feeling mm -hmm. where the pressure is. So, you know, somebody's, if you're in bottom of mount, somebody's got their chest on you and you can't really see what they're doing no, with their arms or, or you're feeling their weight distribution and figuring out which pass you have to go to or, or, or I'm sorry, which escape you're going to use and mm -hmm. how to position them. So I think a lot of that is, is, is so much feel than it is eyesight. So. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. So jujitsu is awesome. <laughs> All right, we got one more All right. for time-wise. Let's see. In the meantime, mm -hmm. Chewie, you have a seminar on Friday, correct? Mm, yeah, well, I have a seminar quick. on Saturday. Saturday, doing sorry. A, we do a we do a Q and A, or we do like an open mat Q and A on Friday. So whenever I do seminars, I like to do a seminar on Saturday, Q and A on Friday, and then I like to do like. You know, we're starting to do the same where we do a dinner on Saturday night. Nice. Um, so try to like have as meet people as and much as possible. Where? It, we're in Lewisburg, West Virginia. So it's a friend of mine, Adam Martin. They run a, a him and uh, some of the guys down there, Alex. Uh, they run a gym um, down there. Can they still sign up even if? Uh, yeah, they can. I mean, they can show they up. They show up. up they, right? Yeah, they can okay. show up the day of. Cool. Um, if they want to look up the details, if they go to my Facebook. Um, the Jiu Jitsu Facebook, they can go in there and look up the events and it's listed there and they can get information on it. Nice. Well, good. I want people to, if you want to hang out with Chewy, get, ask him more about his diet. Ask him more about his diet. Yeah, you could. Because you <laughs> you're, 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 you're going to be probably eating. Is there any, uh, have you been there before, Lewisburg? Yeah, I've been there before. Yeah. We went there last, uh, last year. Yeah. Nice people. Yeah. Anywhere good to eat you like out there? Uh, you know, honestly, Lewisburg was nice. Like, you know, like, because I was expecting kind of like, you know, middle of nowhere, West Virginia kind of thing, but it was actually really nice. Like, they um, they, had, they, had a, they had a good coffee shop, had good coffee, so I was happy. Oh, that's nice. I know. And then they uh, they had a couple of good restaurants that we went to, so we were, uh, we were satisfied last year, yeah. All right. And then if you guys, just in case you guys don't know about it, like, I give away, and I'm just sharing this with you in case you guys are there. On my website, jujitsu.net, I give away if right now. I'm probably gonna get like ch take them down soon and change it up a little bit. But I give away right now a free ebook that has a bunch of drilling tips. It comes with a video as well, and then I have an ebook on setting up a game plan. Both of those come free. Um, if you're on my email list now, if you're on my email list, I send out emails in the morning, and so you'll probably get an email in the morning from me just talking about random stuff like I talked about today. Um, you know, you can you can subscribe at any time and keep the ebooks, but um, they're there if you guys want them. So. Yeah, so let's this last one here, and let's do this. Let's see. Maro, Mayro, hey Chu, I've started jujitsu about three weeks ago, and after every practice, I feel a deep pain in my muscles. It feels like my bones are aching, especially my biceps. Is it normal in the beginning? It is normal in the beginning. A lot of times in the beginning, I, I, I can almost guarantee you, I think that's what this probably is, you're probably holding right this and you're tensed up the whole time. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember when I would come out of jiu-jitsu training and wrestling and all this stuff, my forearms would be swollen. It felt like they were, like, just swollen. Like, it was hurting. And I remember the whole the next day, my whole body, bro, would be sore. I remember it. And uh, I kind of missed that feeling. Because you don't get that feeling anymore, right? Like, the only time I get that feeling is after a tournament. But I remember feeling like that, like, almost every hard training session. But what's happening is your, your body is going through the adjustment process because you've only been there for three weeks. And so what's happening is, is when you start rolling, you're in, like, fight or flight. And you're just stressed out. And you're just squeezing, right? And so your, your muscles are just getting taxed super heavily. And so what you need to do is just understand that over time, you'll learn how to relax. Now, you want to try to make sure that you relax as much as possible so you can kind of, like, you know, not wear yourself out as much, but understand it's more of a process. And as you get more familiar with the position, your body will kind of ease up a little bit and will begin to relax a little bit more. Um, and the soreness goes away as your body adjusts. Your body goes through kind of a, almost like a hardening process, like where it gets used to jujitsu. Mm -hmm. And so at, over time that goes away. But that, that tightness and the aching that you're experiencing, it's pretty normal. Um, it's, again, it's your buy-in, right? Like there, the thing about jujitsu is it's cool as heck. It's, it's really awesome and you can, 
you have this you develop the skill that nobody else is going to have but the only problem is, is that you've got to buy in and it, there's no way to circumvent that process you've got to actually train you've got to like endure a little bit of discomfort that's normal um the only thing you might want to try to do is maybe do like i like a little bit of co I like contrast showers so i'll do like especially now it's winter time i'll go cold water get really cold hot water cold water hot water and then i'm good um i don't you know you can do the ice baths and stuff like that if you want to i see people saying ice um I, uh, what, ice for like the forearms and, and the arms? Let's see, I'm looking at, some people are saying like, uh, ice. I honestly, I don't prefer ice. I, I don't mind doing an ice bath, I don't mind doing like an ice shower, but I don't really like doing like ice on my, if it's a, if it's an inflamed area, mm -hmm. that inflammation process is there for a reason. It's not like it's a bad thing, it's basically your body trying to heal a thing. And so if I want, if I do something to nerf that, I don't like that idea. Like, I, I remember reading about this even back, I, I've never used ice. Like, I just never, it never seemed like a good idea because I was like, wait a second, like, but because I read about inflammation, I was like, well, inflammation is the body's like sort of way to try to repair, try to help, to heal it, right? So if we get rid of that process, just, nature doesn't do anything for no reason, right? It doesn't just, yeah, we're just, we're, we're going to create inflammation for no yeah. reason. Like, no, there's just a reason why it's there. And I, you know, for me, I was like, well, I'll use ice if I'm really uncomfortable and I can't sleep or something, but otherwise I'll just let it heal up and just take some time off. And like, I've never taken it ibuprofen. I never took any of that stuff. I'm like, because it just, it doesn't seem like it's, I'm, I've always been kind of a naturally based person. So I'm like, if it's happening, it's happening for a reason. Yeah. Not because it's not supposed to happen, right? I, it might be in the way of my progress. It might be in the way of my, whatever I think it is, but this is what my body's going through something and I have to respect that. Yeah. I think uh, the, the key ingredient that a lot of people miss mm -hmm. is doing a good cool down, stretching okay. afterwards, stretching the forearms, things like that. And then, um, it's a range of motion, gentle yeah. movement. Like don't just, if you've been gripping, you know, don't really, really hard, your forearms are on fire. Gentle range of motion, gentle stretching, because what you're doing by moving the, the joint, you're helping blood mm -hmm. circulate, mm -hmm. pump some of that blood out, get some fresh blood in, you're promoting the healing process, you're promoting recovery, um, you know, diet's another thing like we talked about, make sure, you know, you're not deficient and you know, you're not dehydrated really bad or anything right, like that. Right. I think a lot of that stuff, um, Ice, like you said, is is good for like I prefer it for pain. Mm -hmm. If I like, I just like tweak my elbow or something. I'll right. put it on there for like ten minutes, five ten minutes. But I usually don't use it consistently. I use it for pain and maybe just a little bit get some of that a little bit of inflammation down to allow the. It, but I usually won't use it. I think the inflammation is good, mm -hmm. but it can be bad if inflammation stays there for a long period of time and restricts movement and restricts kind of other you know healing process because sometimes it can't that blood can just stay stagnant in there and you can't move the joint it hurts uh -huh. you have to get some movement in so in order to do that you may need to ice it a little bit to get some of that swelling down so you okay. allow for movement so i think there's um a time, I, a time know, place. there's a time and place mm -hmm. but some people are like oh well just ice it and i don't think that's going to do anything like as far especially for that area it, you're going to get more stiff and then it's going to be kind of uncomfortable i think cool i think heat's even maybe even better do some range of motion sure all right, so I think that's uh, that's it for today, guys. So thank you guys for joining us this morning. And um, do we got anything going on? No, you've got the. We have a couple of guests we're working on. Um, <clears throat> so, but that's about it. We'll, okay. we'll, we'll get those to you guys when we know who they are. We haven't confirmed we know who they are, but. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's probably it. We're still still working on some other stuff. Yeah. Um, so we, we got some stuff in the works. We'll let you guys know more later on. Um, but I think that's it for today. So guys, thank you so, so much for joining us and uh, we'll talk to you guys next time. See you later.